What's that now? Oh, I guess it's overdue, right? All right, so what I thought I'd do is, um, so, you know, I, I mean, I've taught Revelation before, and um, it's not something that everybody teaches all the time, or very few people teach. So I figure a lot of people are visual learners like I am. So I do have PowerPoint slides, and um, sometimes I use them, sometimes I don't. It depends on where I'm at, but sometimes the visuals help a little bit. So this is just, tonight's kind of a, a warm-up, kind of an introductory thing. And um, I thought what we do is um, kind of ease into the book of Revelation and discuss with you a little bit about approaches that we might take in the book and get some feedback from you as well as what you'd like to hear, what you'd like to see um, going into this book. Um, I don't know about you, how you feel about it, but um, this just isn't one of those books you can rush through and do a really good job. I've, I've rushed through it before, and there's so much we had to skip over, and, and um, it kind of bugs me, <laughs> you know. But there's some cool things. I've learned a lot since then. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, some of the um, things I've figured out that you'll find it beneficial. But I want to hear back from you, too, what you hear, what your thoughts are about it. And I want to be, be more of a free flow of information and discussion. So yeah. are you saying that people can reach out? Oh, yeah. This is, this is, this is not, this is not a, a pulpit or a podium. Some for me to set my computer on and my Bible on, but I, I can tell you right now I need a lamp right here, but that's all right. Um, and just a little give and take and back and forth. And I want to hear um, questions that you've had. And we live in interesting times. As you know, it's getting weirder and weirder over the last few years, right? I mean, it's just, this world is unbelievable now. But... You've been hearing a lot from people and seeing posts on Facebook or other social media. Everybody's got an opinion on where we're at in the book of Revelation. You know? I, at least once a week I'm hearing somebody saying, I think we're in, we're in um, Revelation chapter 9 over here now and all this, these kinds of ideas. And I think this and I think, ooh, this is uh, getting the injection. That's the mark of the beast and all these kinds of things that way off the mark but you know if you're not into scripture regularly and and you don't really know how to interpret scripture you can come up with all kinds of crazy things and, and come up with some bad ideas so i thought it'd be good to as we go into the book of revelation is also um as i've done a little bit in the past get into a little bit of Hermeneutics, which is just a fancy word of saying Bible interpretation. What, when you're reading a book that very few people know and everybody's got an opinion, how do you know that you're understanding it correctly? Or if somebody does come along and say, yeah, Jesus said this in Matthew 24, um, and I, I, think, I think this is the mark, and I think the Antichrist is this guy over here in Europe. You know, and they might post an article about the guy or whatever. So how do you know if, it, if it's him or not? What types of resources do you use? So I thought it would be fun to have some discussion and just figure it out and discuss some of this. Um, a lot of it we don't need to figure out in the sense that, uh, you know, maybe we've never done it before. Maybe some of you haven't done it before, and that's fine. So I think this is a perfect opportunity to... Get the utensils out, sharpen them up, and um, go to town and figure out exactly how we do come up with the right answers. Because there are several different approaches to the book of Revelation. Several different approaches to how you interpret the Bible, right? Um, some people like to say that the book of Revelation is one of those books. Anytime you talk about 
in time books, um, books that have to do with cataclysmic things that happen in the end. They say it's it's the apocalypse. It's an apocalyptic book. So Zechariah might be another one. Daniel's another one. You know, Ezekiel's another one. These are apocalyptic writings, apocalyptic going, oh, you know, we think about, it's the apocalypse, and people say that, and they do it in the movies and stuff. Oh, no, it's the apocalypse. Oh, and so, what does that mean, and, and how do we interpret all that? But, you guys have thoughts or other questions or anything on how we approach it? Other things you've heard or want to know? or Feel free to jump in. That's, that's yeah. all good. Oh, the Genesis. Yeah, I went through it all, and it was very interesting. They're fascinating, I huh? I really studied um, this book, so. It's, uh, it's kind of like Genesis is paradise lost, right? That's where everything, we lost everything. And Revelation's paradise found. So the two, yeah. we lost all here, and then here's where we cover it all and what it looks like in Christ. So, um, well, let's just stick a big toe in there and, and just take a look at and see. Um, what I'll probably do, and I want to recommend, I'm not going to do this tonight, but next week what I'll do is I might put a whiteboard up here and just draw a line on it. And then maybe as we go week by week, and you can do similar in a notebook, is as you pinpoint areas and what, where they go in the timeline of Revelation, um, write it down on, on the piece of paper. And why, do I, why would I suggest that? Well, the reason why I would suggest that is, here's an example of one of the weird things about Revelation. <clears throat> Some people believe that, okay, back up a second here. What are the major um, judgments that most people are familiar with in the book of Revelation? Do you remember? There's three major ones. The seals and the bowls and one more. The trumpets. Okay. So the order that they're in, in in Revelation is you start off with the seal judgments. And then the next round of judgments it talks about is the trumpets. And then the final round of judgments in the book of Revelation are the bowls. Or sometimes in old school language or King James Version it might say vials. So these are God pouring his wrath out on, on the earth. Some people will look at those and go, okay, well, I see some similarities there. There's um, some earthquakes going on. There's some plagues and disease. And then there's um, maybe some flood. There's a war. There's a, you know, and they'll highlight certain things and they'll say, hey, these look like the same events. And some people will actually try to layer them and try to say that it's kind of a restatement of the same judgment, the same judgments, just you know, and um, just they split them up and restate it in different ways. But they all happen at once. So there's that perspective. Um, that's not a perspective I hold. Um, I've looked at that and examined it for about 30 minutes. <laughs> and there's all kinds of good reasons. We'll get into the reason why we toss that away. One example of the reason why we can toss that away is that there's seven of each of these judgments. And they begin in chapter 6. Now, when you get to the seventh seal, by the time you get around to the seventh seal, when the Lamb of God opens up the seventh seal, it opens up the trumpet judgments. So the seventh seal is the seven trumpets. Okay, so these seven trumpets, each one happens, and it's a blast, and not in that kind of not not a good way, kind of a blast. It's a blast of a trumpet and there's judgment, and each one follows the other in order. And when you get to the seventh trumpet, it hearkens or calls forth the bowl judgments, and then you've got the bowl judgments. So you can't have them all happening at once if 
the final respective judgment is the one that starts off the next batch. But for some people, that's not good enough. And, and if that's not a good enough way to look at it, here's, some, here's another example. Um, Jesus and Paul said a couple things about the judgment in the end. Um, and he likened it under birth pains, right? So what do we know about birth pains and what was Paul, what was the point he was trying to make and what was the point Jesus was trying to make in talking about um, the end and it being like um, a woman in labor and birth pains? Yeah, well, it does. But what's really characteristic of painful, and I take your word for that, it, <clears throat> Okay, so contractions. Okay, and they build. Okay. And that is what they both say. So what happens is, is that, um, you know, a woman, when she's getting ready to give birth, um, in the days leading up, there might be what they'll call um, practice labor or putsy putsy labor. Your body's getting ready. And some of those muscles are flexing. Okay. And things are getting ready. You're going, ooh, what was that, you know? Mom will kind of feel that going on. And the baby feels it too. Sometimes the baby will kind of let it act like, hey, knock it off out there. You know, they'll push back. But then um, as you get into real labor, and it, and it, it depends on the mom and the baby. But let's say, you know, let's say it's a one-day period. Well, what ends up happening, if you're fortunate enough and it's all happening within a, a day, is you'll start off with real easy kind of twinge, like, ooh. I felt that one. I wonder if that was it. Then it might be 10, 15 minutes later, you might feel another one and go, oh, wow. Yeah, there's something going on here now. And it's not real intense. It's enough where it's like cramped, like a little bit like, ooh, wow, okay. But then what happens over time? They get closer and closer together, and they're building an intensity. Where after, when they get to be about five minutes apart, and they're like, you're really feeling them and kind of saying, Oh, gosh. Whew. I feel that one. It stop you dead in your tracks. You might be going for a walk because the doctor says, oh, you know, if you're going to go into labor and you're having contractions, go for a walk. It'll help regulate them and time them because you don't want them to start and start up again in two more days. Go ahead and go for a walk. Well, there's times when they build in enough intensity that it'll stop you in your tracks as you're going for a walk. And you'll, okay, I think I'm good. Okay, let's keep going. And you'll walk. So they build and build and build and build. <clears throat> And then after a while, it's just blind, intense pain, as I understand. Uh, and um, the type of thing that um, you know God has designed a woman to go through that I, I think it's insane, and most men will sit there and blanch, watching it, saying, "Ah, oh, okay, I want to. I want to do. I'd rather do like Ricky Ricardo. No, you know, go wait in the living room for little Ricky to be born because this is too, you know." So, birth pains. We see this pattern in the book of Revelation, where you have the seal judgments, and what we're experiencing right now, and what we see in the world right now, it's pretty bad. It's, I mean, it's, but it's bad mostly in a crazy way. Um, I'm not going to say it's not a painful way, because as we know we got brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world who are suffering persecution. There's always been persecution, but it's it's getting more and more intense and more and more global in broader and broader areas. And some of that's coming home to roost now, right? And we see this in Canada and in certain states here in the United States to where there's pastors being arrested. And um, you know, some people, some church people have had the beat down because they decide they want to go to church and, and show up, you know, Mask or not, they're going to, you know, exceed that capacity of whatever it is, one-third your building's capacity to come in. No, you're not allowed to do that, that type of a thing. So we see some things that are getting really uncomfortable, and we can see and visualize more than, uh, say, uh, 50 years ago, people coming up in the United States didn't know this kind of persecution. It's happened elsewhere in the world, and there's places, always been places that have been horrific. You know, whether it's former Soviet Union or China or uh, Vietnam, North Korea. I mean, we could keep going to all these different examples. But 
and then over the centuries, there's been this kind of a a thing going on too. But um, what we see, though, is an increase in those things. <clears throat> and that's what Jesus said. Um, in the end, he said, earthquakes would increase, famines and pestilences would increase. Now, if you want to look at pestilences, like if we're going to look at COVID right now, we've always had things, you know, and they had the Spanish flu once upon a time and, and all of that. But So we've always had these times like this. But, but the difference now is that some of these things are getting to be more global, right? They're not just, oh, they've got this bad thing in this country and this bad thing over here. So these things are growing, increasing in intensity in their um, broader in scope. Um, as soon as the rapture happens, and we'll get into the rapture and how we believe in the rapture and why, because a lot of people don't, but we'll examine the reason why at the appropriate po point here in the book. Um, things will become times 10 on this earth. Um, and the reason why is because because God has a specific, specific purpose for um, this period of time in the book of Revelation that takes place uh, pretty much between Revelation chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 19. And it's a seven-year period, or called it, we can call it the tribulation week, okay? Um, so it increases over time, and it grows in intensity. So you've got um, the seal judgments, and just one example in the seals, because what I was going to do is give you this distinction how I know that they don't all happen at once. The seals, the trumpets, and bowls, not all at once. In the seals, it talks about by the time you get done with all this mess in the seals, one-fourth of the world is destroyed. And it does talk about deaths and numbers and things, so it's not just things in the planet that's destroyed. It includes people. Well, with, with say approximately, for the sake of a round figure, 8 billion people, well, that means 2 billion people dead. So we are not somewhere up in the book of Revelation right now or we'd be seeing 2 billion people dead. Um, I think the figure is something like if you had... Um, I have to look up the numbers again. Something like if you had a, uh, a billion people dead and you had to bury a body... Um, every second, it would take like 31.5 years to bury everybody. So needless to say, is you've got infest, infestation, um, plague, disease. You're going to throw a lot of people at burying 2 billion people. Okay. Now when you get into the trumpet judgments, the number that the Bible uses there isn't one-fourth of the world. At this point, it describes one-third of the earth. So either God has a contradiction here, or he doesn't know math, or he's lying, right? Does that, any of that make We know that's not true. But, so, 8 billion people, 2 gone, that leaves 6 billion people. One-third of 6 billion is another 2 billion people by the time you're done with the trumpets. There's half the world population just right there alone. And now you're finally starting to get into the middle of the tribulation. What? So it's going to be ugly. It's, it's going to be a horrible time. Um, it's something we watch for um, only in the sense that we're watching for the rapture. We're watching, we long for the return of Christ, the second coming, all of that. We want the delivery just as Paul said about the earth, about whole creation, all of creation groans and moans, want deliverance. So the whole earth is groaning. We talk about earthquakes increasing and all of that and all the volcanic activity that's going on right now. It's, it's um, I mean, God's decided to go ahead and not just be figurative, but be very literal in the way he's playing all of that out. And I think the best way to look at all this too is God is just and holy and he's righteous 
and we are not. We all deserve eternal damnation because um, we all start off with a heart of rejection of Christ. But God steps in and forgives us for our sins. He takes care of our salvation in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Lived the perfect life that we couldn't live as a substitutionary life for us. And then died on the cross as a substitutionary, like the Lamb of God. And so, what God is doing is shaking the earth is no excuses. Nobody has any excuses. He's shaken to get attention. The seals, seal judgments come. He's shaken really hard then. Got your attention now? And then you have the trumpet judgments. And he's going, hello? You know, doo -doo, trumpets. All the bad stuff that happens, more people... He's trying to get attention, so nobody will have excuse because um, even now people want to blame God. And how can a loving God do this? How can a loving God kill all these people? Well, every man, woman, and child is on their way to eternal death. But God, right, intervening on our behalf, where we don't deserve it. Who are we to stand in judgment over God? So, it's his love and his mercy um, trying to take things to these lengths. So, that's kind of an example of the way we know that the book of Revelation is pretty much written the same way as the rest of the books of the Bible, and that's what? Chronological order, right? It's written in order. Now, also in the book are going to be um, what we call parenthetical chapters. Uh, every novel's got them. Probably every TV show you've ever watched has them. Uh, every radio serial has them and movies have them. In other words, you've got different events that inform the same period of time, but things are happening in different locations. Um, you know, uh, in the TV series 24, Jack Bauer is uh, running down a back alley in the street, and he's got his pistol out, and he's looking for the spy he just chased in this blind alley. Okay, meanwhile, meanwhile, what they'll show is at the same time, over here in this apartment building, these terrorists are putting this bomb together, right, and they're putting it all together. These things are happening at the same time. Well... Reality is a lot more complex than that, and so is the book of Revelation a lot more complex than that. So, well, we've got things going on on the earth. We've got some things going on in heaven that are described. So Paul will get, Paul, John will get to a point where he'll bring us up to an event and he'll go, oh, um, there's these two witnesses. And then he's got a flashback because you won't know what he's talking about. He says, okay, there's, there's these two witnesses. And he'll describe what happens and what they do and what their powers are. And that brings you up to speed here. And then he'll get to another point and he's going, okay, um, there's also 144,000 witnesses, 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel. And John will go in and say, from this tribe, 12,000. And from this tribe, and he goes tribe by tribe and lists how many thousands from each of those tribes and talks about what they're doing. So John has got to play catch up a few times and bring us up to speed and what's going on. Otherwise, when we get to a place and he says, hey, this is going on with these guys. Oh, I didn't tell you about those guys yet. Because when we get up in the middle of the tribulation, we find out there's a weird event with the two witnesses. And I've got good reason, good cause for believing that these events do happen in the middle of the tribulation, and I'll get into the reason why. Not everybody believes that. A lot of great, solid Bible teachers think that all the two witnesses start in the middle or a little bit later, and then they, they wrap it up at the end of the tribulation. Well, I'll go into the reasons why I think that that doesn't line up and work out. Why? And you see, you see if you agree with me or not, and we can discuss it. But So John's getting ready to describe something whether this happens with the two witnesses, and, and uh, you know, the beast comes out of the sea, the Antichrist, and Satan. Satan finally destroys the two witnesses, finally. And he's had it. 
and they lie dead in the street for like four days, and everybody's having a big party, <clears throat> and they're exchanging gifts. You know, happy Dead Witnesses Day, woohoo! You know, that's what they're up. That's what they're all about. And um, then on the on the fourth day, they stand up, they upright in front of a whole world sees, and and then they ascend into heaven. Well. If he starts talking about two witnesses and they died and whatever else, you're going to be saying, what? Wait, whoa, whoa, John, hold on. What are you talking about here? Who is these? You know, so he's got to go here and there and he's got to catch us up. So what we'll do when we outline this and we'll look at it is we'll look at, try to look at it by chapter and figure out which chapters are part of the chronology of what's going on in the earth and then which chapters are parenthetical chapters. And, and kind of where, if they overlap, you know, you've got the regular timeline of chapters here, events, and then you've got uh, these parallel chapters. You might, chapter 13 is really starts taking place here, this, that type of thing. So we'll see if we can lay them all out. Does that sound good? And maybe, so maybe we'll whiteboard it, we'll figure it out. And with all your input, we might even figure out that, oh, you know what, that, that's a great point. I think we need to adjust that here. So there'll be hopefully some good discussion where we can figure some things out and you might help me see some things that I didn't notice before because that happens. Let me tell you about the last couple years. There's a few things like that that have happened that have been like, oh my goodness, where didn't I, I can't believe I didn't see this before. How did I miss that? You know, I'm just praising the Lord for, for um, helping me see something that I never saw before. And I hope the word of God is like that anyway, every time you open it. It's, I know you've all experienced this. You're in a passage that you have that you've read that you have read a dozen times before, and all of a sudden now you're reading it and something jumps out at you that you just how in the world did I never see that before? And it's beautiful. That's the Holy Spirit working on you. So when you're getting into the Word in your personal study and you spend time in prayer, um, praying, but maybe before you get into the Word, even stopping and praying a little bit, or as you're going in your in your studies, and then when you're done, then with your then you're, you're, you want to lavish the Lord with lots of praise and thanksgiving for what He's showing you and what He's going to do in your life. So, so that's the kind of that's the kind of thing I want to approach with the Book of Revelation too. The other thing I'd like to do um, is when we get to key passages, like I said, when we get to where we would have to estimate the rapture happens in the Book of Revelation. You kind of hit the brakes there for a little bit, and let's grab some more passages of Scripture and plug them in and try to figure out how that fits into our timeline. And if, if we can do it on the, on the whiteboard too, but on your piece of paper, maybe underneath, maybe a little a note, a little number, a little number 11 or whatever, and seven note, and then, you know, put in there Matthew 24 or whatever, that type of thing. So um, what are... What are, off the top of your heads, some other, outside of the book of Revelation, some other passages that you figure we'll probably end up pulling in and looking at? Come on, I've been yakking, yakking, yakking. Now it's your turn. Just off the, you don't have to remember, I don't necessarily, you don't even have to remember exactly where the reference is, but, but that passage that talks about this, whatever. Jeremiah does. Jeremiah calls that period the time of Jacob's trouble, right? But Daniel, mm -hmm. Daniel would be a good one to read in, in your time, um, especially Daniel 2 through 12, especially in that little window there. There's a, read the whole book, but I mean, in there is a lot that informs the book of Revelation. It's kind of like the book of Revelation for the Old Testament. And there's a lot of really cool parallels. So those are good passages. What else? Zechariah's got, yes, absolutely. There's a lot in Zechariah about um, what's happening in Jerusalem. Um right in the middle of this period and all the way to the end. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the Olivet Discourse, right? The big one, the one that's probably, that informs us the most is going to be Matthew 24. 
Um, there's a lot in there about this passage of Scripture in this, this period of time. Okay, so those are some good examples. Um, so we'll stop, pull some of those in a little bit too. How about um, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5? And then you can take a quick little hop over into the next book, chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. There's some stuff in there about the Antichrist. Uh, people are f- full of all kinds of ideas and opinions about the Antichrist and who he might be and who he might not be. And there's actually a lot more in the scripture about the Antichrist than, than what people realize. Um, you know, the Antichrist at some point ends up um, harmed with a sword, a mortal wound with a sword, and it ends up taking out an arm and taking out an eye. That, that happens. Um, the scriptures talk about that. Um, because Islam is a big field, big thing, it's a big deal, it's on everybody's radar these days. Everybody looks likes to look at uh, the Antichrist, or maybe when the Antichrist comes, he will be Muslim. A lot of people hold that view. What do you think of that idea? It's a, I think that's a very valid point. Ask a Jew. You know, are you going to follow a yeah, Muslim as, a, as your Messiah? Yeah, I've never met, I've never met a, um, a Jew that would say right on. Um, I'm sure they're out there, but they're going to be in the minority. Um, also, one of the names, one of the nicknames for the Antichrist is called that Wicked Prince of Israel. Oops. You know, so, so we'll look at some of those. Yeah, you know, I, I think what might be a cool thing to do so we won't get down too many rabbit trails will be we come in we, right roughly 6 o'clock. We'll get going for, you know, approximately an hour. I don't know. I don't want everybody to stay here till midnight or anything like that, but I mean, uh, we, so we'll go for, you know, like roughly an hour or something like that for a Bible study. And then that way whoever needs to leave or whatever or wants to can leave or whatever. But if you want to hang out afterwards and you want to, you have questions or something you saw on the news and you want to discuss some of those things, that's a perfect time to do that. So that way we got Bible study time. And we get into the Word, get some notes, see if we can parse some of what we've, we're reading here in the Scriptures. And then... We can shut her down, um, grab a quick snack, get something to drink or whatever, and, and whoever wants to come back in and, and uh, discuss more about some of uh, the day's events. Because they really are getting more and more hard to keep up with, aren't they, all the things that are going on around us. And, um, so people, and people have questions. We, we go to work and school and whatever we do in our daily lives, we run into people all the time who have some different ideas and conflicts, and they have questions. Um, and we're told in Scripture to always be ready to have an answer for the reason for the hope that lies within us. So, um, sp- speaking of um, our reason for the hope that lies within us, let's see if I can pull this up real quick. So why... Why prophecy? I thought I would share this with you too. Um, why Jesus must return to earth is part of that, but also why prophecy, okay? Prophecy occurs in one-fifth of all scriptures. That's a lot of Bible passages to be ignored from the pulpits, right? And from seminaries. The second coming accounts for one-third of that. So there's more about the second coming than there is actually about the first coming. Okay, there are over 660 general prophecies. Half of those concern Christ. Of these 333 prophecies, just 109 were fulfilled in the first coming. That's a lot of prophecies waiting in the wings, right? This leaves 224 yet to be fulfilled in his second coming. 
of the 46 Old Testament prophets, less than 10 of them speak of the first coming. 36 concern his second coming. So, you know, as the saying goes, we ain't seen nothing yet as far as the fulfillment of prophecy concerning Christ. In the Old Testament, 1,845 references to Christ's rule on the earth. 17 Old Testament books give prominence to this. In the New Testament, 318 references to the second coming, mentioned in 23 of the 27 books. I think God wants to tell us something. Next to the subject of faith, the second coming is the most dominant of the New Testament. That's something we should probably be getting excited about or what? For every time in the Bible the first coming is mentioned, the second coming is mentioned eight times. For every time the atonement is mentioned, the second coming is mentioned twice. Jesus referred to his return 21 times directly. This is one of my favorite verses, and this is part of the reason why we do this, and it's the attitude every believer should have, right? Waiting, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all, law, all lawlessness and to purify, purify for himself. I got my tongue wrapped around my eye teeth and can't see what I'm saying. To purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Titus 2, 13, 14. There's another one here. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. And, key verse here, everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. First John 3, 2 and 3. So holiness. So a major reason in looking for Christ is because it's going to bring about purity, holiness. Because you're watching for your master. Um, Related to that would be, say, for instance, um, do you know there's a, a part two or a sequel to the Olivet Discourse that a lot of people skip over? Matthew 24 isn't the only chapter about the Olivet Discourse. I don't know what that is. Okay. On the, Jesus, on, at one point, was, on, uh, it was in the temple, and he was preaching to the public. And that, you'll find that mostly in um, the version that's in, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. So he's in the temple, and he's telling them things concerning himself and what the end is going to be like and the horrible things that are coming, okay? Then Matthew 24, and also Mark 13 is a parallel to that. But Matthew 24, uh, Jesus leaves the temple, and he's got um, a handful of his disciples with him. Um, is it Peter... James, John, and Andrew, I believe it is, are the, are the ones who are with him. I think Matthew th or uh, Mark 13 mentions Andrew was with them. So they're walking up to the Mount of Olives, and that's why it's the Olivet Discourse, the Olivet Discourse. Sounds like the Olivet because that's where he preaches Olivet concerning the end. <laughs> so he's on the, he gives the Olivet Discourse concerning the end in Matthew 24, and it's quite lengthy. They ask a threefold question. It's not really three questions, but it's a threefold question. And, um, and I, it's really tempting to get into this right now. We won't because we, we don't have the time to dedicate it but, to that, but it's well worth reading. So in all of Matthew 24, he's talking about the things that are coming on the earth. Now, with Bible prophecy, it isn't as simple as um, prediction, Fulfillment, ta-da, you know, that kind of a thing. 
what we see in the Bible is all kinds of types that echo in the Old Testament. And then you'll see a partial fulfillment. And then you'll see an ultimate mother of all fulfillments that completes the prophecy completely much later on in the future. Okay, some um, rough examples of this. Um, the echo types of, of, of foreshadowing we see of Christ. Um, Moses and the bulrushes. Got to go and hide Moses because they're coming to slaughter all the babies. Why does that, what does that sound like? Well, didn't we, we see that also with Jesus. Same type of things. Got to get Jesus out of Okay, that's a foreshadowing type of thing. There are things in the Bible like, um, oh, let's see. What's a, what's a real good example? Um, there is, from Daniel, there was a, a prediction that what was called, the angel Gabriel tells Daniel about, the abomination of desolation. And it goes into the details of what's going to happen with the abomination of desolation. Well, what does that mean? Well, a few years later, was this, this evil king came along, Antiochus Epiphanes. Well, what he did, he went into the temple, he slaughtered a pig in the temple, put up the statue of Zeus in the temple. That was the abomination that makes desolate. So people look at that and go, that was fulfilled already, Antiochus Epiphanes. That was done. Okay, well, yes. Is that the ultimate fulfillment, though? Because if it's the ultimate fulfillment, then how come a couple hundred years later, Jesus on the Mount of Olives is telling his disciples, hey, that abomination of desolation thing that Daniel wrote about, watch for that. And they go, whoa, 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 whoa. That, that happened 200 years ago. Well, Jesus is clearly saying is there's something yet future that's an ultimate fulfillment of that that happens. So is that a pattern though? Yes. The Israelites and what Homer is about the message. So isn't it a pattern that that's how God is uh, uh, present fulfillment for them, prophecy, and then a future fulfillment? Mm-hmm. Of that? So that we know by pattern that's how that works and that's how Yeah. Future, so that's Which is another example. Um, getting into Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, what we see is um, Ezekiel 36 and 37. Remember uh, the old Negro spiritual song about Ezekiel built them dry bones. Now hear the word of the Lord. The foot bone's connected to the ankle bone. Well, what that is is the Lord came to, and that's as good as my singing gets after all this illness of this last week. But anyway, um, God at one point tells Ezekiel, son of man, he shows them this valley of dry bones. Can these bones be made to live? And Ezekiel's going, what? I, you know, hey, what do I know? <laughs> the Lord explains to Ezekiel, as Ezekiel's watching, you see these bones pulled together, and it sounds like kind of a horror movie or something. The bones pull together, and then they start filling up with sinew and veins, and then flesh comes on them and stuff. And next thing you know, you get living bodies around and stuff, and they aren't even zombies. So, what it was is God, when you read the passage, is talking about how there's going to be a time in the future when the land is barren and laid waste. And that happened after 70 AD, right? The Roman army decimated Jerusalem. They were scattered on the earth. No civilization ever in history has been ever been broken up, scattered, without being just... Uh, intermarried, mingled, and lost to the ages. Just, they're gone. Who knows? Hittites? I don't know. Is somebody around here part Hittite? Who knows? Nobody knows. Nobody's tracking it. Whatever. Nobody cares. But yet, May of 1948, what happened in Jerusalem, in Israel? Yeah. So that is not the fulfillment of that. Ultimately, because ultimately, we have the promised land. God promised Israel, stood Abraham up on top of the mountain, said, Abram, as far as your eye can see, that's going to belong to all your offspring, all your children, 
from here to here. He marked off the rivers, everything. Israel, there was a time, and in, in folks would like to point out in Joshua, says, see right there, it says, oh, Israel's finally in the land. Yes, they were in the land. They didn't possess the borders yet, though. Israel has never possessed all the borders that were promised to them. Um, all the way up to 70 AD. No, nope, not then either. They were in captivity a couple times before then, too. We know the Babylonians were in it. It was, it was a mess. And we, we know some of the history or should be learning it, and we're figuring it out. But um, They've never had all the land. God promised it to them. Well, how do we know God's going to fulfill it? Well, God keeps his promises. Well, this, the Jews broke their promise, or they didn't follow God. They didn't believe in Jesus, so God's Ichabod on them, and he forgot about them. No. Paul makes it really clear in Romans 11, among other places, that no, God's good on his promises. He'll keep the promise. It wasn't a two-way contract. It was a promise. And this is something that a lot of people miss uh, about how that works. In an ancient culture, in Abraham's culture, God is speaking like he does in the Bible. You've heard this before, maybe, that the Bible is God's baby language to us, his baby talk to us, because he's so far beyond us, right? right? In his wisdom, we don't understand what God is, you know, unless he talks baby talk to us in the Bible, we can't possibly comprehend anything of what's going on. And what we do understand is just an nth of what he's doing and what he has in store for us. Well, so he condescends to speak to us in our terms and ways we'll understand. Abram was the same way. God, we didn't have the Old Testament back then. So God makes this promise to Abram and goes, but, you know, no disrespect, but how do I know you're going to keep that promise? I mean, I don't really... How do I know? I don't know you. you know, I mean, I know you, but I don't know you. Because he doesn't have all these promises to look back on, right? And said, so, well, wow, look what God did with Israel, and look what he did with Moses here, and look what he did with David, and look what he did with... He didn't have that history. Right? Abram started, he was at the head of all that. So, God says, oh, here's what I'm going to do. And he gets a bunch of different animals, some doves and different animals like this, and he says, you just sit right there, Abram. And this was probably pre-incarnate Christ, which is mind-blowing because it's before it was Jesus. It was still the same guy before we knew him as Jesus. So as God came down in the form of a man, pre-incarnate Christ, and he did this. This happened a few times in the Bible, right? Came and visited uh, I, um, what am I saying? Isaac, right? Came to visit Isaac. You know, where's your wife? Oh, she's in the tent. And why is she laughing? Oh, she's not laughing. Oh, yes, she is. You're going to have a son, and his name's going to be Laughter. Because he's pre-incarnate Christ. He knows what's going on. So he came, comes down in the form of a man. Well, he did it with Abram. Okay? And he takes these animals, and he cuts them to pieces. A gory mess, right? Like a sacrifice. And he puts them on the ground. And by himself... He walks among them. Now, why did that happen? Well, if you and I make a covenant, a contract, an agreement as two gents, what we would do is we'd cut up the pieces. You'd cut up some, and I'd cut up some. And we would together walk back and forth through the pieces. Meaning, this is what happens to you or me if we break our contract. So that's where a two-sided contract or an agreement is. So the fact that God had Abram sit on the side and says, I'll show you my promise, and he did it by himself, meant that he's the only one who can break it, and he won't break it. It's a promise. He's the one who's going to keep it. We find language to that effect, too, in the book of Galatians about the law and how we know God's not slack in his promises to Israel. So God makes this promise to Abraham and He's going to keep it. It was never part of the agreement that Abraham had to keep it and be perfect. That's not going to happen anyway, right? That's an easy contract to make if you know the other bloke's going to blow it. It's like, yeah, I'll make sure. I'll agree to anything. Loser, you know, you're not going to keep it because we're sinful. Well, God knew this. So he makes this promise with Abram. So back to Ezekiel 36 and 37. Now we got... 1948, Ezekiel's Valley of Dry Bones, 
the sympathy that Israel gets because of what's happened with six million Jews um, tortured, murdered in the concentration camps, the Lord uses something as heinous as that to get the sympathy of the world so that they could say, you know, if we just have our one little slab, we just want our ancestral home. There have always been Jews there, Bedouins, wanderers there, but they wanted a land that in, over there in Palestine that they could call Israel. And the UN agreed, the other nations agreed, paper was signed, and war started ever since, and hasn't stopped, right? That begins the fulfillment of that, but the ultimate fulfillment is at the second coming. And it won't be until the second coming when Jesus steps down as Messiah and they finally have the promised land and they finally have Jesus on the throne of David as Gabriel promised Mary she would see. Your son will sit on David's throne. That isn't fulfilled either. We know it's not fulfilled now because was David's throne ever in heaven? No, he may, might wish. <laughs> David's throne is not in heaven. It was in Jerusalem. So it'll be the ultimate fulfillment of that. Now this is what we're going to see when we're looking at some of these prophecies and we're going to expand some of these, open them up and apply them and realize so many promises God has for us. What are we doing in heaven when this mess is going on on the earth. So we're not going to learn about just the mess on earth. We're going to see what's going on in heaven at the same time and how that plays out. Where are we at the second coming? Then what do we do at the end of the second coming? At the, end of this, at the second coming, if we're believers now and we are raptured, we've got our glorified bodies. Um, okay, so... There's the second coming and Jesus comes back to earth. What do we do? do we, are we hanging out up there in heaven for a while while Jesus is having a party down here? Where are we? What, what's, we're with him. Exactly. We're with him. Um, and then we learn about the millennial kingdom, right? And, because it says six different times in Revelation 20, it uses the term thousand six different times, right? I think God's trying to tell us something. That's where the word millennium comes from thousand so there's a, a block where there's a thousand year period where jesus sits on the throne of david in jerusalem we come back with him so when we come back with him what are we doing when jesus comes to sit on the throne of david and who else is hanging out in jerusalem and what are they doing and then when we hit a thousand years what happens at the end of all that and there's this big war, this big battle that happens at the end of a thousand years. Where did the bad guys come from? Right? So we've got some of these things that we're going to look at. We're going to look at the whole sweep of what the scripture talks about, how it comes to be fulfilled, and what our part is in all of this. And we'll see if we can pull together these desperate passages, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all these, pull them in and try to sort them all in to the timeline that we'll build on the book of Revelation. Sound good? Questions so far? Or is your head swimming a lot? But it's cool stuff, right? So automatically when you start talking about going into um, the book of Revelation, some people you know, start kind of looking at you horsey-eyed like, oh, you're one of those weird UFO conspiracy Bigfoot type people, aren't you? You know? Well, oh, are you a date setter? Oh, you're a rapture head, man. You're one of those, and they want to, ooh, just get away from me, man. You'll get that reaction. You'll get people saying, cool, that's awesome. Well, I'm hoping that you'll see that there's a way to approach the book of Revelation without getting into some of the weird YouTube fringe stuff that is out there. You spend a little time out there, and you can go down some weird rabbit trails, and there's some people who have some really interesting ideas i'll put it that way okay but what we're going to do is what to examine and what tools that we we come to this with to understand it rightly because this is not going to be just dave sitting here spoon feeding out my opinion okay um 
if there's a God above and he's merciful, you better hope it's not from me. But um, I want you all to feel comfortable and, to, and even if you don't walk away feeling like you're an expert, I want you to feel like that there's, by the time we're done, there's any book in the Bible that you can crack open and apply the same kind of principles of Bible interpretation and, and look at the same tools, learn how to use some of these Bible tools that you've got and some references and uh, examine some of that themselves. I just want to say real quick bef before we wrap up, are you guys getting worn out yet, tired? Because I mean, I can. Um, I want to give you a couple of outline things with, with the book, and I, I don't want to leave without doing that. So we, we went over this and the reason why we study it, but in some of the climate, the pitfalls, um, we don't want to get into what's called newspaper exegesis, which is what we kind of hit talk around this evening. Where no, okay. Right. So or, I, I or another another way to put it. Right. Another way to put it is. Yeah, I have this pet idea. I bet I can find some verses to prove that. I could probably go in here and find verses that prove Bigfoot. I don't know. Bigfoot might exist. He might not. I don't know. Um, probably not like the Saturday morning cartoon type version or whatever. But anyway. Um, that's eisegesis, and that's where we read into Scripture what we want it to see, or we go in with the presupposition, so we proof text. Exegesis is you go into authorial intent. It's just a fancy way of saying what the author intended when he wrote it. So what you want to try to understand from the Bible is, what did John mean when he said this? Stop trying to read in your own stuff and go, ooh, I think this means this, you know, and try to prove some weird point. Um, so proper exegesis are certain rules that you apply to try to determine the meaning from the scriptures of what the author originally intended especially God and part of that is going to be um, another principle that we'll just call synthesis which means another one of those fancy words that just means all the scripture is going to agree with itself it's the same ultimately it's all the same author God right He's not going to contradict himself in any way at all. So a passage in the Old Testament is going to agree with a passage in the New Testament, and all these, they're going to agree. Like, if, for instance, sin deserves a blood sacrifice. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there are some rules that are consistent, and there's some that that aren't. So when we if we look at some of these terms, and we look at it again, it's context. We have to figure out where the rules can be broken and where they're not, if they're ever broken. And that's you know what that kind of means is that means you got to kind of get into the word and dig a little bit sometimes. Okay. And so we need to find out. Well, we have who's a good teacher to listen to on that and who's not and, and that type of a thing. So I, I just want to get into all that. But so if anyone here too wants to bring an old teacher and say, hey, you like this guy or whatever, you're okay with that? We can discuss that, sure. All right, so I, I want you to look real quick at, um, at a couple things in Revelation chapter 1 before we bail on it because we've been at this for roughly an hour. And I don't know how long you guys want to spend on it. You can tell me later if you want to, would rather go 30 minutes longer. I don't know. But, it's, but um, Revelation is the only book of the Bible that comes with a special blessing. Okay? And I want to show this to you. Um, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and who hears the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. 
So the special blessing for reading, hearing, and keeping the, the book of Revelation. Now, how does that work? How does that play out? We can get into that, but I mean, it starts going to start with reading it, okay? Um, there's another significant part I want to show you that will give you in the first chapter an overall outline of the entire book. If you look at verse 19, this is very cool because Jesus is, he's the first and the last, and he's here speaking directly to John. And then in verse 19, this is what he says. He says, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which shall take place after this. So that's your outline for the whole book right there in chapter 19. The things which you've seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The things which you've seen, John's going to get into, in verse 1, he's writing down the things which he's seen, and he's there talking with Jesus, so he writes that down in the first chapter. Okay? Um, the things which are, what, what are the things that are? In chapter 2 and 3, he starts talking about church different churches. And we know from Paul's other writings, for instance, he gave examples about how we live in the church age. And we are the church, right? We're the universal church of Christ. So those are the things which are. And the things which take place after this. After this is a, is a term in the Greek. It's just metatauta. It means after these things. And it's significant because the word comes up again when you get at the end of this church age. At the end of chapters 2 and 3, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Metatauta, or after these things, I looked, and behold, there's a door standing open in heaven. Okay, so that's your outline of the book. Very cool, right? Reformed type people will tend to look at the book of Revelation more in this very symbolic type of language that they'll call apocalyptic language. I mentioned this earlier, right? Amen, Laura? Okay, that's just the way it is. You've got certain books that you look at, and it's because it has to do with the end times, and it's confounding, and it's probably already happened by 70 A.D. So it's, um, ap it's just apocalyptic language. It's figurative language. It's really hard to understand, and you probably need to filter through somebody else who knows a lot more than you do. So it's apocalyptic language. Um, you don't even read Revelation, put it that way. Because it's too, you know. Right. A lot of people, Laura's right, a lot of people in those circles will just avoid the book like the plague and they'll just decide because you can't. It's symbolic. So so you paint yourself into a corner when you say it's all figurative language because, okay, who gets to decide what the symbolism means? Yeah. Hmm. And then they'll argue with each other, you know, and so and then after a while it's just, oh, I guess kind of, never mind, you know, that all happened. And it just means something else. The numbers and all, they don't mean. They just, it's symbolic. Symbolic for what? They hate those discussions. They really do. But they'll say, it's just what's weird, and this is the reason why I wanted to mention this, is because two, broadly speaking, two, it's a two-forked road of uh, Bible interpretation, okay? One is the road that, that um, I tend to take, and we take at the Master's Church, for instance, and a lot of people will take, and that is, what's called the literal view of the Bible. What does it say? That's what it means. If it, if it sounds like it's symbolic, it probably is. If it starts describing a red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, is it literal? Well, I mean, God can do that if he wants, but if you keep reading in the passage, it goes, oh, and here it is. The red dragon is this, and each of the horns means that, and it tells you what the symbolism means. So you just assume literal where it makes sense. Um, if Jesus says, I am the door, well, he's not saying he's wood planks with hinges and a doorknob on it, right? So where it's clear that it's symbolic, it's symbolic. But otherwise, read it like any other book. It means what it says, and it says what it means. Well, some people, like I said, will say, oh, that's apocalyptic language. Well, that's interesting because Revelation is called the apocalypsos or the apocalypse. You know what the word apocalypse means? 
It means revelation, revealing. It's the revealing. It's not the obfuscating. I'm not trying to cover things up and make it dodgy and symbolic and murky and ooh, I don't know what that means. It's the apocalypse does not mean, ooh, that's the big boom at the end of the world. That's the apocalypse. Boom. All the movies, oh no, it's the apocalypse. Yeah, that's right. It's, yeah. So that's not what apocalypse even means. Apocalypse is the revealing. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's where we get the name of the book. It's in the very first verse. The revealing of Jesus Christ. Not the obfuscation and the cloudy and the murkiness. So I contend there's no such thing as apocalyptic language in a way that means that Okay, there's, there's this classification of scripture you can read and you get all kinds of sound doctrine and, and listen, some of the Reformed people are the best people in the world you're going to find on proper exegesis of scripture. Brilliant minds. Great. And then they get into these areas and they ooh, the, fall apart and the legs, legs become jello. Okay? Really wishy, squishy. Some great teachers I love. And they just, their legs turn to jello at this stuff. Um, and they got to make up this classification and call it apocalyptic because, I, I don't know, we can't know what it means. It's something that, it's figurative language. It's apocalyptic. There, there's nothing, I don't think there's any precedence in Scripture at all for calling any of it ap apocalyptic the way they mean it. Okay, it's the revealing. It's for clarity. It's unveiling. It's taking the murkiness and cloudiness. It's like, okay, take the cobwebs from your eyes and let's look and see what's coming. Okay, so that's what the book is about. So we'll wrap it up there. Um, any questions any, so far? Yes. Are you going to keep it like in order, like chapter 1, chapter 2? Yes. We're going to go in order. What I would like to do, like I said, is start off with a real broad outline and then flesh it out as we go but we do want to do it in order, yes. We're going to go chapter 1. We're going to spend some time in chapter 2 or 3. To be honest, unless, unless you guys persuade me otherwise, I wasn't going to spend... There's some cool things to pull out of those chapters that we definitely need to look at, okay? So a couple weeks in chapters 2 and 3. The, uh, the letters to the seven churches. One of the cool things about the letters to the seven churches is that when you read it, it's direct dictation from Jesus to John. Do we have any letters of the Bible that are like that? Well, I mean, you could say, yeah, he wrote the whole Bible. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean like this, where he sits down with John. He's saying, John, write this down. I mean, this is John writing down, okay, yes, Lord Jesus, what it, and he's writing down word for word, the words of Jesus. That's pretty cool. Seven epistles, seven letters of Jesus. Wow. I mean, that, that's just mind-blowing. So, so some neat things to pull out of here. You could easily spend a week in each one of those seven churches. But I think what most people want to do and where they really want to feel like they're going to be edified is in how you pull overall the whole book together and looking at the end times and, and, and how the prophet Daniel sorts into this and what happens when the tribulation starts. And... Um, I don't want to abandon chapters 2 and 3 because they're important and there's some significant things concerning us, that um, some significant ways to apply it in our lives. And we'll definitely get into that. This is all introduction here. And next, So next time I want to start with chapter 1 and get into all this. So yes, we will go in order and we'll, if we have to slow down a little bit because there's questions, I'm not afraid of that. Okay. Um, if you have questions, you think of questions throughout the week and you want to shoot me a text or an email, give me a heads up, say, hey, there's this question I've got. Can we maybe talk about that when we get there or can we talk about that next week? And I'll take a look at that and we'll see what we can do. I, that's what I want it to be. Very much uh, organic that way and the way we handle it and um, answer these questions that you have because, um, to be honest, you're not you're not going to get it very many places out there, and if you do, it can be some from some dodgy sources. You know, there's some churches that, as far as sound doctrine goes, they're really squishy in, in their theology. 
So you probably don't want the book of Revelation from some of those churches, okay? Because they've got some practices and some things that are really questionable. So I want to be honest, and that's the intent, is to handle it the way the Lord would have us handle the Word of God and um, break it down in ways that we can understand author authorial intent, the way the Lord intended it and the way John intended it, Okay? Any more questions for now? All right, so we're going to close in prayer real quick, and then we can continue talking if you want. Lord, we love the word, the word of God. We love what you've done in pulling it together in a way that we can understand just a little bit of an insight into you and what you have in store for us. We know we get none of it and deserve none of it but for Christ. And we praise your name for that, Lord. We pray for wisdom and insight as we get into this very controversial book, very misunderstood book. And Lord, we pray for those who wanted to make it and some are still struggling a little bit with some health issues. We pray that you bring everybody back healthy next week and uh, let everybody just enjoys the ride, getting to know each other a little bit more and getting to know your word. But Lord, the fellowship is such a huge thing. And to know that we're going to share in some of the things discussed in the future for all eternity, God. That's what an awesome thing. Praise your name in Jesus' name. Amen.